From Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson here, and ahead today, K-State's Sarah Lancaster will discuss the just-announced approval of three dicamba herbicides for use on dicamba-tolerant soybeans and cotton starting in 2021. She'll go over the label restrictions that now apply to these products, including a new requirement for addressing the dicamba drift issue. Also today, K-State's Terry Griffin will talk about farmer use of precision agriculture apps on mobile devices, which is the subject of a new analysis that Terry has authored. And on this week's horticulture segment, K-State's Chuck Audi offers advice on attracting songbirds to the home landscape in the fall and winter. All that and more here on Agriculture Today. While many people know hunger is an issue in developing countries, it is also a problem in our own backyards. In 2010, one in seven Kansans struggled to put adequate food on the table. Two K-State research and extension programs are tackling this problem. The Family Nutrition Program and Expanded Food and Nutrition Education Program reach thousands of Kansans and more than 70 counties. They learn how to eat healthy with a low budget. For more information about these programs, visit ksre.ksu.edu. Welcome to this Agriculture Today on the K-State Radio Network. As always, glad to have you aboard. Well, the Environmental Protection Agency this week has just announced important news for soybean and cotton growers who are interested in dicamba-tolerant production. Three dicamba herbicides have been cleared for use starting in 2021 and beyond, And there's lots to the story here, so we brought by, to discuss it all, Sarah Lancaster. Sarah, as you know, is a weed management specialist with K-State Research and Extension. Sarah, one thing we might say right out, this development has been awaited, at least the decision on the disposition of these dicamba herbicides, right? That's right, Eric. You know, as a product, these over-the-top dicamba formulations have had a a very interesting life cycle so far. And so this is just, you know, the latest in the, the uncertainties and the various decisions that we have, have had to, to deal with with this. So, you know, the big issue came this summer, right? Most folks will remember that in June, the Ninth Circuit Court went through a process that resulted basically in the cancellation of the labels for Extendamax and Genia and Fexapan. And so, you know, growers will remember well the anxiety that that has caused. Mm -hmm. This announcement that came through on Tuesday is kind of, you know, the news we've really been waiting for. You know, earlier this month, we had the news that the Extend Flex soybean system has got full approval and will be commercially available. And now we have some answers on what are the labels for these dicamba products going to look like for 2021? Now, noting that going back to that court decision, we're talking now about two of those three that were being considered in that court action, right? That's right, Eric. So there were three products that were affected by the court ruling. That was Extendamax, Ingenia, and Fexapan. And um, the labels that we're looking at today are for Extendamax, Ingenia, and Tavium. Let's talk of what's happened here as far as changes in the label requirements for use of these products. And this includes all three. And you note right out there are variations amongst the products, some subtle. You might explain that. There are some differences among the requirements for the products, Eric. Um, I think the things that farmers are going to want to pay most attention to um, are the application cutoff date the expanded buffer requirements, and the new requirement for something that the EPA is calling a volatility reduction agent. And that's installed there because of the drift concerns. That's right. That's right. So all of these changes are related to stewardship of the product in terms of preventing damage to non-target plants. The key thing to remember on the application cutoff is going to be a date of June 30th for soybeans and then July 30 for cotton. So June 30 for soybeans, July 30 for cotton. Now the Extendamax and Tavium labels both have some additional uh, restrictions on that in terms of soybean. So for soybeans, for Extendamax, 
Bear has added an additional restriction of June 30th or R1 soybeans, whichever comes first. So if you have soybeans that are in that full flowering stage, that R2 stage, that makes that an off-label application. So it's through R1 or through June 30th. And then for Tavium, because Tavium is a premix of dicamba with Dual, so Dual has an application cutoff for soybeans of V4. So that's the, the limiting factor there for, for Tavium. So it's June 30th or V4, whichever comes first. So one of the big conversations around this cutoff date, Eric, has to do with what do we do with double crop soybeans, right? right? Because as you know, that June 30 cutoff date is going to leave very few opportunities, if any, for dicamba applications in double crop soybeans. As far as the other label requirements, though, and you mentioned the the adjuvant products required, uh, volatility reduction agents required across the board here. Mm -hmm. That's right. So let's talk adjuvants required for the system. So we mentioned the new requirement for something that the EPA is calling a volatility reduction agent. Bayer is producing a product and BASF is producing a product. I believe those names are going to be Vapor Grip Max and Centris um, for folks to look for in the marketplace. But EPA is telling the companies that they have to have enough of this available so that every single application with either of these three products, so the Extender Max, the Ingenia, or the Tavium, will have to have that added. So that needs to go in the tank as you're mixing. And then the wording regarding the drift reduction adjuvants was a little squishy, shall we say, on the 2020 labels. And that has been solidified on these new labels. And so the, the DRAs are required across the board with all of these products. And one important addition to the labels, which we should stress here as well, this applying to all three compounds here, a distance required for downwind buffer from the field. That's right. So previously, the buffer requirement had been 110 feet in the downwind direction, and they've expanded that to 240 feet. Um, That's going to be a much larger area there. Um, But that is across the board with all three products, Eric. Um, The other thing that I've had some conversations about, especially here this week, has been the fact that that buffer can be reduced to 110 feet if a grower chooses to use certain approved hooded sprayers. And so just like with the approved spray nozzles and the approved tank mix partners, the information about these approved hooded sprayers will be on these company-maintained websites. So the www.extendamaxapplicationrequirements.com, www.ingeniatankmix.com, and www.taviumtankmix.com. So those three websites will be the go-to for farmers for um, lists of approved spray tips, which that really hasn't changed from the previous labeling for the approved adjuvants and other tank mix partners. And again, what guys to remember that um, they need to have that volatility reduction agent as well as the drift reduction agent. So addressing both primary forms of off-target movement for the product. Um, And then those hooded sprayers will be listed there as well. Do one's homework is obviously important here as we look toward the next soybean or cotton production season. One more thing might mention here, that is the ability of individual states, Sarah, to modify the federal label requirements here. That has been altered to a modest extent. Right. So, you know, one of the things that had been happening in the last couple of years, Eric, is that states had been adding restrictions to that federal label for these over-the-top dicamba products. And a lot of states had been doing that through a mechanism called a Section 24C label. So that's a special local needs label. Um, EPA has issued some clarification that um, that is not an appropriate way to uh, make those changes to the state labels. And so they have directed states to a different mechanism that I haven't done a ton of reading on it, Eric, but my initial reading is that it's going to be a bit more cumbersome for states to make those changes to the labels. 
all of this has considerable importance not only for those who are growing or intending to grow dicamba tolerant soybeans or cotton, but for those who are intending to plant non tolerant varieties. And uh, you have some survey information that indicates that growers, at least for 2021, may be gravitating more toward those non tolerant crops. So there are a number of dynamics here that that suggest good stewardship of these products and their usage will be vital. That's right, Eric. I just I can't stress enough the importance of doing our best to follow these stewardship guidelines. It's important for other farmers who are planting non-dicamba tolerant soybeans, which, you know, on a on a rough estimate My survey suggests that there's going to be more non-dicamba tolerant soybeans in Kansas in 2021. So there's going to be more opportunity for crop injury. But, you know, it also affects how these regulatory agencies and let's just say activist groups um, that are, are opposed to the technology, how we handle this. They're watching very, very closely what happens this year. And if we have another train wreck this year, it's going to be difficult to make a case that we can use this technology appropriately. So, you know, people are watching and we need to do the best we can to do right. Sarah has just authored a new article on this very topic with all of the details that we've covered here and much more in an e-update newsletter segment, which is coming out tomorrow at agronomy.ksu.edu. Check that out in the e-update series. And we'll likely be discussing this even more as we move on through the winter and approach spring planting time. So, Sarah, thanks for passing along what's developed right here. Appreciate it. Thanks, Eric. Weed Management Specialist Sarah Lancaster, K-State Research and Extension, with more on the EPA new approval of labels for over-the-top dicamba applications to dicamba-tolerant soybeans and cotton. You're tuned to Agriculture Today. Legal and financial concerns surround the day-to-day management of the agricultural industry. Producers, ag creditors, and USDA agencies rely on Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services. If you've received an adverse decision from the USDA or have an ag credit concern, call today, 800-321-3276, or visit us online, Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services. Exploring options, generating solutions. You're listening to Agriculture Today. Well, the ongoing evolution of precision agriculture production practices and the technology that supports them is our interest on this first part of the program, as our guest has just put together a new write-up on agricultural use of precision ag technology and the increasing reliance on mobile devices on the farm and ranch. It's an intriguing topic. Terry Griffin is with us. Terry, as you know, is a precision agricultural economist with K-State Research and Extension. So, Terry, you basically put together this review of where we're at with precision technology and how well it's being utilized on the farm or the ranch today. And that usage is on the incline, isn't it? It has been, you know, not just the adoption of the smartphone devices, but also on the number of apps that farmers are acquiring from private sector uh, sources or, you know, universities are, are developing a lot of apps for mobile devices that are used on the farms as well. Uh, so we're seeing a lot of increased use across the board. You know, go to a farm meeting, you know, it's nearly ubiquitous. That it seems like everyone has a smartphone in their pocket and here you know we're, we're talking about how we're using uh touch screen devices like smartphones and tablets and so forth and how they're used you know on the farm you know we have law farmers who are using the smartphones just like our uh, counterparts in urban areas do we, we use it for driving directions and uh, checking the weather but you know farmers are also using this for specialized agricultural uses taking photographs of an unknown pest and sending it to our county agent or extension specialist and trying to communicate with 
uh, sales agronomist and uh, keeping track of employees and where employees are with, with farm equipment. Lots of uses on the farm of, of these devices. You say, Terry, again in the article, that the apps that are available to producers on their mobile devices fall into two broad categories, the standalone apps and those that support precision agriculture systems. Okay, so a standalone app kind of works on its own, and you know we can think of this as uh, looking at weather. Most everyone will have a weather app, and it doesn't necessarily connect uh, to other platforms, but provides weather information to, to the user. Uh, same idea as commodity marketing information and so forth. But those apps that connect to other platforms, uh, especially in precision agriculture, are becoming a lot more common. And, you know, think of some of the big data companies out there. You know, they have a platform that you log into from the dashboard on your laptop computer. But there's also little apps that work with that, that will work on an iPad or a smartphone, whether it's Android or Apple. And those usually require the larger platform to be operational or, or subscription to that for those to be effective. And uh, we see these apps operate in field equipment, for example. Drones come to mind, you say. Oh, yeah. You know, we've all seen those videos of um, folks using their smartphone to control a UAV or drone. And you know, in real time, some you know, if we have good enough connection, we can have a video on the screen of what the camera on the drones are showing. Mm-hmm. So that's a, another really good use of you know, our smartphone. You know, monitoring crop moisture from sensors that are on uh, soil probes and irrigation system information about if everything's operating correctly or if we need to make adjustments. Then we've seen this exponential growth in the use of mobile apps as a precision technology tool for farmers and ranchers. What, if anything, might slow that down? And you referred to this in your article as well the availability of the proper infrastructure to make those apps go in our rural areas. That remains a formidable issue, you say. Yeah, you know, one of the main limitations in areas where agricultural commodities are produced is the lack of wireless connectivity. You know, so uh, internet service providers put the infrastructure in where we have residential and where people normally have uh, voice communications and text communication for smartphones. One of the big limitations in agriculture is there's not a lot of people who live where corn and wheat are produced relative to the cities. And therefore, we do not have the same wireless infrastructure. Um, There's a big debate whether 5G will be a thing in rural areas anytime soon. There's a huge political issues that are being debated some at the state level, some at the local level, about subsidizing wireless connectivity in rural areas. And it's not just wireless. It's getting the actual uh, wired connections to public libraries and rural hospitals and schools. And and those of you who have um, uh, children in public schools or even private schools right now, especially during the pandemic, uh, we're seeing how important wired connectivity is to our home so that our Children can participate in uh, virtual learning. Children who are trying to access the Internet at the same time that um, you were having a business meeting on Zoom or trying to interact with others. And you can really tell that there's been a a trying amount of bandwidth um, at your home. But in agriculture, you know, our our tractors and combines and, and cotton pickers and planters and sprayers I don't foresee it's ever been possible to have a wire going to those things. So it's going to be wireless connectivity mm-hmm. in an area that people normally just do not live in. So that, that's going to be a major obstacle. And that's, you know, one of the reasons I really stopped to think about, okay, how do people, everyday people in society, as well as agriculturalists, farmers and crop consultants and county agents, how do we use mobile devices in practice for you know everyday living as well as in business and the connectivity issue is huge we have seen periodic efforts 
to address that issue, but they've been somewhat piecemeal, Terry. So Mm -hmm. do you see any opening for this starting to really pick up steam and that infrastructure start to come together in our rural areas, or is that a ways off? I think there's a lot of effort being devoted to this, although I don't see a solution that's going to present itself in 2020 or maybe even 2021. I've had lots of conversations with telecommunications companies and cooperatives in Kansas, as well as some uh, fairly small sub-state groups in other states. And they have really good aspirations of wanting to get wired connectivity to all the residential areas Mm -hmm. in the county. But that doesn't solve the wireless. You know, we got to have a wireless tower that taps into a wire. The way I understand it, you know, I'm not a you know specialist when it comes to that. And from what I understand, I don't think satellites will be the answer for us trying to move data from farm equipment. You know, those might be sufficient for email and social media, but not necessarily for the types of data that we move, the packets of data that we move in, in an agricultural context, like packets of yield monitor data coming from a combine, getting it moved uh, to the cloud or to to some other storage facility. But then again, the reliance on these apps, the data that they can collect and can manage locally anyway, that's going to remain, it would seem, in agriculture. This is going to be a staple of farm and ranch management, it would seem, for some time. So at, at some point, one would think that all will come together in this area to to facilitate that even more efficiently. Yeah, I think so. All the pieces are in place for these systems to be operational in you know, just a matter of time. And we are going to see some barriers along the way. And you know, one barrier, I don't fully understand it, but it seems to be there is a potential legal issue, a, a dispute on intellectual property on touchscreen devices being imported into the United States. And, you know, we think about the value of precision ag or the value of smartphones to farmers and agriculturalists. What would be the cost of us losing touchscreen devices in agriculture, not just in everyday living, but in production agriculture? And, and there, there are some very real examples of how that could be a fairly large, fairly substantial amount of money. This will remain on the front burner for many in agriculture for some time to come. And this write-up really captures where we are and where things need to fall to advance this cause of mobile device-based precision agricultural technology even further. The article is by title, Agriculturalist Use of Precision Ag Technology and Reliance on Mobile Devices. It is currently posted on the agmanager.info website, and we'd certainly urge folks who would have an interest in this topic to get a glance at that write-up. Terry, good work, as always. Thanks for joining us right here. Uh, thanks, Eric. It's uh, good to be here, and, and I just want to remind our, our listeners that you know this is a document they may want, you know, assuming that most of our listeners are farmers and agriculturalists, mm-hmm. and this is one of those documents you may want to share with your landowners and some others who are somewhat not directly connected to agriculture, so they get a better insight into how we use ag technology, how we use technology in agriculture. Terry Griffin with us, Precision Agricultural Economist, K-State Research and Extension. Agriculture Today is back in a moment. Did you know every Kansas farmer feeds 128 plus people? Kansas farmers are hard workers, dependable, authentic, and sensitive. Not only do farmers put food on your table, but they put clothes on your back and fuel in your car. For more information about Kansas farmers, visit K-State Research and Extension online or stop by your local Extension office. This message has been brought to you by the K-State Animal Sciences Leadership Academy participants. Agriculture Today continues now. Eric Atkinson with you, and now with today's lead stories and agricultural news for you in brief He's courtesy in part of DTN. Two years after filing a Freedom of Information Act request with the EPA seeking information about companies granted small refinery exemptions to the renewable fuel standard, two ethanol groups have asked a federal court now to issue a ruling requiring the agency to provide more information. 
The EPA released a number of documents last month in response, but according to court documents, the agency made a number of redactions, including refinery locations and the names of their parent companies. Growth Energy and the Renewable Fuels Association filed a motion for partial summary judgment with the U.S. District Court for the District of Columbia on Tuesday. Now, these groups say the EPA's refusal to disclose basic information about the exemptions granted is reducing nationally mandatory volume requirements outside of the public's view and beyond the reach of adversely affected entities who would seek judicial review. In the original lawsuit, the uh, group said the EPA and the U.S. Department of Energy were uh, stonewalling their requests dating back to April of 2018 and missed deadlines outlined by the Act since 2018. 2016, the EPA has granted 85 small refinery exemptions, amounting to about 4 billion gallons in biofuels demand. The ethanol industry has been pressing the agency to comply with a ruling in the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Tenth Circuit in Denver that ruled that the EPA had mishandled the program. Ethanol groups want the agency to apply the ruling nationally. And refineries producing transportation fuel are required by the RFS to demonstrate each year they've blended certain volumes of renewable fuel into gasoline or diesel or acquired biofuel credits called RINs. The RFS allows certain small refineries that uh, produce less than 75,000 barrels per day to petition the EPA for those temporary extensions of an exemption. And to date, the EPA has yet to make public details regarding how it determines who qualifies for those small refinery exemptions. Well, among the highlights from the 2020 National FFA Convention being held this week virtually... The Udall FFA chapter of Kansas was named the 2020 National Premier Chapter in the Growing Leaders category. Yesterday, during the third general session of the 93rd Convention, the National Chapter Award Program recognizes outstanding FFA chapters that actively implement the organization's mission and strategies. They improve chapter operations using the national chapter standards and a program of activities that emphasizes growing leaders, building community and strengthening agriculture. Those are the categories. Chapters are rewarded for providing educational experiences for the entire membership. National FFA recognizes those top chapters with innovative activities in those divisions. Chapters that receive three-star ratings during judging are eligible to compete for those premier chapter awards. And 10 FFA chapters competed in the virtual presentation for that honor. So congratulations to the Udall FFA for that Highly deserved recognition. And nine winners of the 2020 National Agricultural Proficiency Awards were named during the fourth general session of the convention yesterday. Agricultural Proficiency Awards honor FFA members who, through supervised agricultural experiences, have developed specialized skills that they can apply toward their future careers. Students compete in areas ranging from agricultural communications to wildlife management. Lucas Falkenstein of the Labette County FFA chapter in Kansas began his supervised agricultural experience with 18 does that he raised with his family and six higher quality donor does that he purchased from breeders. And using that base herd and a breeding program of natural service and AI, he built uh, quite an operation using an online marketing platform to sell his goats across the nation. So once again, Lucas Falkenstein, the national winner in goat production. He's supported by his parents, Melissa and Rish, and his FFA advisors, Kyle Zwaylin, Dustin Wiley, and Keith Guerin. Our congratulations to Lucas. And later on today, we will know if another Labette County FFAer, Abby Goins, is successful in being selected as a national FFA officer for 2021. She is a finalist for one of those posts. The new national officer team will be named during the closing session of the convention this evening. Now this week's Kansas Soybean Update with Greg Akagi. Greg? 
Dorvar Ruiz Diaz, professor and soil fertility specialist in the Department of Agronomy at Kansas State University, joins us. And you're one of many scientists across the nation working to improve nutrient usage in all commodity crops. So can you tell us about your studies on that topic with soybeans? We are working in a second year project right now focusing on potassium nutrition for soybeans in, in collaboration with the Soybean Commission. The nutrition of potassium in Kansas is something that tends to be more of a challenge in the eastern part of the state where soils tend to be lower in potassium naturally compared to central and western Kansas. And obviously it's a region where we have most of the soybean acres. So it is a, a topic that we are trying to understand better, specifically looking at diagnostic options, how we can make decisions for fertilizer applications, but also management options in terms of what to do for applications of fertilizers, timing, and how we can uh, maximize uh, yield response to these uh, essential nutrients. Because potassium deficiency has started to become more and more of an issue. Soybean is one of the big users of potassium. We can remove up to 1.4 pounds of K2O per bushel of, of yield in soybean. As we're pushing yields, we're going to start to see more deficiencies develop over time. And this is exactly what we're seeing in Kansas. It's becoming more of a problem because of the improving yields. In our project in particular, we are looking at aspects such as soil test methods. We learn a lot more about potassium in recent years. And we know that clay type, for example, can have a huge impact in terms of potassium release to the crop. And so we're looking at some differences in clay types, specifically, again, in parts of eastern and, and southeast part of the state, and how we can improve potassium nutrition during the growing season. The second year of this project, we're also finding that there's a huge effect of moisture in season. So we are doing a, an evaluation of in-season supply of potassium in correlation with moisture supplies. And along with this, we're looking at what are the management options. So that ultimately, that's what the farmer wants to find out is how we can deal with this problem. And we are evaluating options for pre plan application as well as in-season potassium application with some very good results. Essentially, when I say in-season application, these are going to be tight dress application of potassium, essentially, when we are seeing some deficiency develops. And preliminary results shows that we do see good yield increases. May not be necessarily 100% of the yield increase, but it's certainly one way to basically rescue soybean yields with potassium application in season. Dorvar Ruiz Diaz, professor and soil fertility specialist in the Department of Agronomy at Kansas State University joins us on the Kansas Soybean Update. It's brought to you by the Kansas Soybean Commission. Thanks, Greg. And this is Agriculture Today. While many people know hunger is an issue in developing countries, it is also a problem in our own backyards. In 2010, one in seven Kansans struggled to put adequate food on the table. Two K-State research and extension programs are tackling this problem. The Family Nutrition Program and Expanded Food and Nutrition Education Program reached thousands of Kansans in more than 70 counties. They learn how to eat healthy with a low budget. For more information about these programs, visit ksre.ksu.edu. Welcome back to Agriculture Today, and once more, it's our weekly horticulture segment. Our weather is steadily converting over from fall to winter. A taste of that earlier this week, as a matter of fact. Thoughts on creating a winter hangout, if you will, for songbirds in your backyard. We have brought in now Chuck Otte. Chuck is the Geary County Extension agent who is an accredited ornithologist on the side, very well versed in songbirds, bird behavior. Chuck, a great project for just about anybody, and, and you've talked with countless folks about making this happen. It really is an enjoyable wintertime activity you've maintained for a long time. Oh, absolutely, Eric. And it's it's something that can be done. It's multi-generational. It can be done fairly inexpensively. Nothing is better than on a cold Saturday or Sunday morning to sit around with grandkids or your kids and, and watch the birds coming and going to the backyard bird feeders or the, or the bird bath. It's just so pleasurable. And in a long, bleak winter, it can bring a splash of color into your day. Absolutely. And to your landscape as well. What birds to attempt to attract? Now, everybody has their favorites, but what recommendations do you bring forth there? Well, there's certain birds that you will and will not bring to your feeders. Things like robins and eastern bluebirds are are insect eaters, fruit eaters. They may come to your bird bath. They won't come to your bird feeders. So we look at the seed eating birds. A lot of the sparrows, the Harris's sparrows, the junco, white-crowned, white-throated sparrows, and others. 
Cardinals are always a, a favorite that the bright red of the males is just such a wonderful thing to have on a on a cold, snowy day. Blue Jays are something else that are going to show up. But then also the chickadees, the nuthatches, the tufted titmouse. There's just a lot of these little flitty birds are going to come and go. And, and the kind of feed you put out and how you present it is going to impact which birds you're going to attract. So give us some guidance on what to provide, how to provide it. Well, I've, I've really taken an approach in recent years to match the feed to the feeders. If you have a feeder that you hang in the tree, you're going to be attracting birds that are going to want black oil sunflower. They don't want milo or wheat or corn or, or prozo millet, the little hard white seed. They want sunflower seeds, plain and simple. So if you have any kind of a hanging feeder, a general hanging feeder, simply buy black oil sunflower seed and put it in that. If you have a what we call a ground feeder or a low feeder, something that they'll pick around at, jump around on the ground, that's where you put the mixed seeds, something that has some safflower, some sunflower, some corn, some millet, some milo in it. Those are the birds that are going to use those are the ones that are going to feed on the ground. A lot of times the juncos, little snowbirds, some people call them, they're going to be on the ground. They don't very often come up to the feeder. Things like the chickadee, the cardinal, the nuthatches, they're going to come to a feeder that's hanging in the tree, hanging off the eaves of your house. So use the black oil sunflower. Also consider putting out a peanut feeder. You may get a few blue jays in there, and blue jays are either a love-hate relationship. Some people love them, some hate them. <laughs> but peanuts will bring a, a slightly different set of species to your feeders. What about suet cakes? Suet cakes are a great way to attract woodpeckers primarily, but it gets cold enough and it's going to attract a lot of them, the nuthatches, the chickadees. You know, soot is nothing more than, than processed animal fat, high in energy. And when it gets cold, these little birds do a good job of keeping warm, but some, some high energy food like soot is really going to bring them in. And sometimes for those, well, finches in particular, such things as thistle seed will work out. Thistle seed is another one of the oil seeds. And maybe that's a phrase I should have used is oil seeds, things that have high oil content, sunflowers, peanuts too, for that matter, safflower, which looks like a small white sunflower seed, and the niger thistle seed or the finch seed, very high in oil, very high in protein. They love those seeds. So, and if you get the finch feed, the thistle seed, get a feeder that has a small little slit of an opening so that the bigger birds, the cardinals can't get into it because they will run through that thistle seed in a hurry. Give something that, you know, a buffet for the finches, the pine siskins only. But then the placement of the feeder in proximity to cover, is that important? It is probably one of the most important things. Birds don't come flying along at 500 feet and give out the alert that there's a feeder 380 feet below. No, they come into the treetops. They work down closer. They want to have what I like to call safe escape routes. They want to know that if a hawk or a cat or some threat to them shows up, they've got a place that they can get to in a hurry for protection. So evergreens close to the feeders, even taking out your Christmas tree at the end of the year. If you have a real Christmas tree, like many of us do, just lay that on the ground near the feeders can make great cover, but also then have small trees and then larger trees and give these safe approach lanes. They can land on the top of the trees and say, well, it looks okay. And then they can hop down a little bit further, get into the top of the small tree, still don't see any threat. And they just keep working their way in. They, they come and they go. Things like the, the nervous little chickadees and the tufted titmouse will come and go you know, two or three times a minute as they get a food, jump out to cover and eat it, and then come back, get some more food. It, it's just, it's very entertaining to watch, as we said earlier. But another essential, obviously, is water. And that's not as challenging in the summer, you simply fill up your bird bath or whatever container. In the winter, though, you have to keep that accessible and thawed. How, yes, do, how do you accomplish that? I, In fact, I had to hurry up and get my bird bath out of hibernation here uh, a couple of days ago and get it plugged in because that early cold snap would have frozen things up solid otherwise. But water is very, very essential. And as I alluded to earlier, with open water, you can attract species that won't come to the feed, the robins, the bluebirds, the cedar waxwings. Water in Kansas in some winters can be hard to come by, open water, and that can attract a lot of birds. So there's there's many different heated bird baths out there. I would say spend a little bit more and get a quality one. Instead of having to buy a new one every year, you'll have one that'll last five, eight, ten years. 
you may pay fifty, sixty dollars for it, but it's going to last. So annualize that expense; it won't seem so bad. <laughs> but then put that someplace where you can see it. Get a bird bath right out the kitchen window, the living room window, wherever you spend time. Put it where you can see it because it'll be a pleasure. And then keep it filled up. If you get a flock of robins that comes into your yard in the middle of January, they can drain that bird bath in about 15 minutes. It's not just from drinking. It's from bathing and splashing it all over the place. But keep it filled up, and you'll be amazed at the activity that you have around that bird bath. In parting, folks that haven't really embraced backyard bird feeding for the winter, you'd surely nudge them in that direction, Chuck. Well, just it's simple. It doesn't take a lot of money to buy one bird feeder, fill it with some sunflower seeds and hang it up and see what happens. And you'll be glad you did. Good advice as always. A pleasure to talk. Many thanks to you. You're sure welcome. He's the Geary County Extension Agricultural Agent and an ornithologist as well. Chuck Otte with some tips there on backyard bird feeding for the winter season on this week's horticulture segment. And our time once again is away. Thanks for tuning in. Eric Atkinson for Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network.